Hello, everyone. For those of you just joining us, welcome to the inaugural summit of the Progressive International. This weekend, we're convening scholars, policymakers, activists, and movements from around the world to confront the central dilemma of our time internationalism or extinction. This is our third panel of the day, following two fantastic sessions on what comes after capitalism with a keynote by Yanis Varoufakis and the years of repair with a keynote by Naomi Klein. If you missed any of these, you can catch them on our YouTube channel or on our Facebook page. For those of you joining us after the short break, thank you for sticking with us. Convening a virtual summit is challenging and to know that we're connected to all of you around the globe is extremely heartwarming. So thank you again for your solidarity. For those looking to follow along in languages other than English, please find the links for the translations below. I am Varsha Gandikota Nalutla. I'm one of the coordinators of the Progressive International Secretariat, and I'm joined today by speakers who are personal inspirations. Our keynote speaker is Noam Chomsky, who's arguably the greatest public intellectual of our time, and many inspiring panelists. Nanjula Neabola is a prolific writer and political analyst whose book Traveling While Black is again a personal favorite. Cornell West, who's a professor of the practice of public philosophy at Harvard University and equally a political activist and social critic. John McDonnell, who's a member of the UK Parliament and a Labour Party politician. Thank you all so much for being here and continuing to guide the Progressive International as members of our council. Today's panel will address the question of internationalism from multiple dimensions. Capital is coordinated. Our struggles against injustice and oppression also must be the same. How can the Progressive International fight back? I want to invite Noam Chomsky to the floor, who of course needs no introduction, but let me have a humble attempt at naming at least a few of his contributions. Noam Chomsky is an American linguist, cognitive scientist, a philosopher, historian, social critic, and political commentator. Sometimes called the father of modern linguists, Chomsky is also a major figure in analytic philosophy and one of the founders of the field of cognitive science. Thank you so much, Noam, for being here, and the floor is yours. Thank you. We are meeting at a remarkable moment a moment that is unique in human history, a moment that is both ominous and portent and bright with hopes for a better future. The Progressive International has a crucial role to play in determining which course history will follow. We're meeting at a moment of confluence of crises of extraordinary severity with the fate of the human experiment quite literally at stake. The issues are coming to a head in the next few weeks in the two great imperial powers of the modern era. Fading Britain, having publicly declared that it rejects international law, is on the verge of a sharp break from Europe, on the path to becoming even more of a US satellite than it already is. But of course, what is of the greatest significance for the future is what happens in the global hegemon, diminished by Trump's wrecking ball, but still with overwhelming power and incomparable advantages. Its fate, and with it, the fate of the world, will be determined in November. Not surprisingly, the rest of the world is concerned, if not appalled. It would be difficult to find a more sober and respected commentator than Martin Wolf of the London Financial Times. He writes that the West is facing a serious crisis, and if Trump is reelected, in his words, this will be terminal. Strong words. And he's not even referring to the major crises that humanity faces. Wolf is referring to the global order, to critical matter, but not on the scale of the crises that threaten vastly more serious consequences. The crises that are driving the 
hands of the famous midnight, a doomsday clock towards midnight, meaning towards termination. Uh, Wolf's concept terminal is not a new entry into public discourse. We've been living under its shadow for 75 years, ever since we learned on an unforgettable August day that human intelligence had devised the means that would soon yield the capacity for terminal destruction. That was shattering enough, but there was more. It was not then understood that humanity was entering a new geological epoch, the Anthropocene, in which human activities are despoiling the environment in a manner that is now approaching terminal destruction. The hands of the doomsday clock were first set shortly after the atomic bombs were used in a paroxysm of needless slaughter. The hands have oscillated since as global circumstances have evolved. Every year that Trump has been in office, the hands have been moved closer to midnight. Two years ago, they reached the closest they have ever been. Last January, the analysts abandoned minutes, turning to seconds, a hundred seconds to midnight. They cited the same crises as before, the growing threats of nuclear war and of environmental catastrophe and the deterioration of democracy. Now, at, at first sight, the last might seem out of place, but it's not. Declining democracy is a fitting member of the grim trio. The only hope of escaping the two threats of termination is vibrant democracy in which informed and concerned citizens are fully engaged in deliberation, policy formation, and direct action. Well, that was last January. Since then, Trump has amplified all three threats not a mean accomplishment. He has continued his demolition of the arms control regime that has offered some protection against the threat of nuclear war, also pursuing development of new, even more dangerous weapons, much to the delight of military industry. In his dedicated commitment to destroy the environment that sustains life, Trump has opened up vast new areas for drilling, oil drilling, including the last great nature reserve. And meanwhile, his minions are systematically dismantling the regulatory system that somewhat mitigates the destructive impact of fossil fuel use and that protects the population from toxic chemicals and pollution. That's a curse that is now doubly murderous in the course of a severe respiratory epidemic, COVID-19. Trump has also carried forward his campaign to undermine democracy. By law in the United States, presidential appointments are subject to Senate confirmation. Uh, Trump avoids this inconvenience by leaving the positions open and filling the offices with temporary appointments who answer to his will. And if they not, do not do so with sufficient fealty to the Lord, are fired. He has purged the executive of any independent voice. Only psychophants remain. Congress had long ago established inspectors general to monitor the performance of the executive branch.
they began looking into the swamp of corruption that Trump has created in Washington. He took care of that quickly by firing them. There was scarcely a flicker of protest from the Republican Senate, firmly in Trump's pocket, uh, hardly a remnant of integrity remaining. They're all terrified by the popular base that Trump has mobilized. This onslaught against democracy was only the bare beginning. Trump's latest step is to warn that he may not leave office if he's not satisfied with the outcome of the November election. That threat is taken very seriously in high places. To mention just a few examples, two highly respected retired senior military commanders released an open letter to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Milley, highest military commander. They reviewed his constitutional responsibility to send the army to force what they called a lawless president who refuses to leave office after electoral defeat, perhaps summoning in his defense the kinds of paramilitary units he recently dispatched to Portland, Oregon to terrorize the population over the strong objection of elected officials. Many establishment figures regard the warning as realistic. Among them are the high-level transition integrity project. It's just reported the results of the war gaming, war gaming that has been conducting on possible outcomes of the November election. The project members, I'm quoting, are some of the most accomplished Republicans, Democrats, civil servants, media experts, pollsters, and strategists around. It's the wording of the project director it includes prominent figures in both political parties. Under any plausible scenario, other than a clear Trump victory, the war games lead to something like civil war with Trump choosing to end what they call the American experiment. Well, again, these are strong words, never before heard from sober mainstream voices. The very fact that such thoughts arise is ominous enough, and they are not alone. And given incomparable US power, far more than the American experiment is at risk. Nothing like this has happened in the troubled history of parliamentary democracy. Keeping just the recent years, Richard Nixon, not the most delightful person in presidential history, Richard Nixon had good reason to believe that he had lost the 1960 election only because of criminal manipulation by democratic operatives. He did not contest the results. He put the welfare of the country above his personal ambition. Albert Gore did the same in 2000, not today. Forging new paths in contempt for the welfare of the country does not suffice for the megalomaniac who dominates the world. Trump has also announced that he may disregard the Constitution and what he calls negotiate for a third term if he decides he's entitled to it in violation of the 22nd Amendment. Well, some choose to laugh all this off as the playfulness of a buffoon to their peril as 
history shows. I'm just old enough to remember it clearly. The survival of liberty is not guaranteed by parchment barriers, James Madison's words when he warned about the fact that words on paper do not suffice. Liberty depends on the expectation of good faith and common decency that has been torn to shreds by Trump along with his co-conspirator, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, who has turned what used to be called the world's greatest deliberative body into a pathetic joke. McConnell's Senate refuses even to consider legislative proposals. Its sole concern is largesse to the rich and stacking the judiciary top to bottom with far right young lawyers who should be able to guarantee the reactionary Trump McConnell agenda for a generation, whatever the public wants, whatever the public needs for survival. The abject service to the rich of the Trump McConnell Republican Party is quite remarkable, even by the neoliberal standards of exaltation of greed. One illustration of this is provided by the leading specialists on tax policy, economists Emmanuel Saez and Gabriel Zuckman. They show in a recent book that in 2018, following the tax scam, that was the one legislative Trump McConnell achievement, I'm quoting them, for the first time in the last hundred years, billionaires have paid less in taxes than steel workers, school teachers, retirees, erasing a century of fiscal history. In 2018, for the first time in the modern history of the United States, capital has been taxed less than labor. It's a truly impressive victory of class war. It's called liberty in hegemonic doctrine. The doomsday clock was set last January before the scale of the pandemic was understood. Humanity will sooner or later recover from the pandemic at terrible cost. It is needless cost. We see that very clearly from the experience of countries that took decisive action when China provided the world with all of the relevant information about the virus on January 10th. Primary, primary among them were the East, were East Southeast Asia, Oceania, others trailed behind. Bringing up the rear are a few utter disasters, notably the United States, followed by Bolsonaro's Brazil, Modi's India, others far behind. Um, despite the malfeasance or indifference of political leaders, there will ultimately be some kind of recovery from the pandemic, some kind. We will not, however, recover from the melting of the polar ice caps or the exploding rate of Arctic fires that are right now releasing enormous amounts of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, nor from other steps on our march to catastrophe. When the most prominent climate scientists warn us to panic now, in their words, they are not being alarmist. 
there is no time to waste. Few are doing enough and even worse, the world is cursed by leaders who are not only refusing to take sufficient action, but are deliberately, knowingly accelerating the race to disaster. The malignancy in the White House is far in the lead in this monstrous criminality with no historical analog. It's not only governments. The same is true of fossil fuel industries, the big banks that finance them, other industries that profit from actions that put the survival of humanity at serious risk. Quoting the words of a leaked internal memo of America's largest bank. Humanity, humanity will not long survive this institutional malignancy. The means to manage the crisis are available. That we should constantly bear in mind, but not for long. And one primary task of the progressive international is to ensure that we all panic now and act accordingly. The crisis, the crises that we face at this unique moment of human history are of course international. Environmental catastrophe, nuclear war, the pandemic have no borders. And in a less transparent way, that is also true of the third of the demons that stalk the earth and drive the second hand of the doomsday clock towards midnight, the deterioration of democracy. The international character of this plague becomes quite evident when we examine its origins. Circumstances vary, but there are some common roots. Much of the malignancy traces back to the neoliberal assault on the world's population that was launched in force 40 years ago. The basic character of the assault was captured in the opening pronouncements of its most prominent figures. Ronald Reagan, in his inaugural address, uh, declared that government is not the problem, is the problem. Government is the problem, not the solution. What that means is decisions should be removed from governments, which are at least partially under control, under public control. They should be removed to private power which is completely unaccountable to the public and whose sole responsibility is self-enrichment. That was the proclamation of chief economist Milton Friedman at the same time. That's the United States. Now, the other leading spokesperson was Margaret Thatcher, United Kingdom who instructed us that there is no society, only a market in which people are cast to survive as best they can with no organizations that enable them to defend themselves against the ravages of the market. Unwittingly, no doubt, Thatcher was paraphrasing Karl Marx who condemned the autocratic leaders of his day, rulers of his day, for turning the population into what he called a sack of potatoes, defenseless against concentrated power. That's neoliberalism. And with admirable consistency, the Reagan and Thatcher administrations moved at once to destroy the labor movement. They understood that that is the 
primary impediment to harsh class rule by the masters of the economy. In doing so, they were adopting the leading principles of neoliberalism from its earliest days in interwar Vienna, where the founder, patron saint of the neoliberal movement, Ludwig von Mises, could scarcely control his joy when the proto-fascist government of Austria violently destroyed Austria's vibrant social democracy and the despicable trade unions that were interfering with sound economics by defending the rights of working people. Von Mises explained his reasoning in his neoliberal classic uh, called Neoliberalism, 1927, five years after Mussolini initiated his brutal rule. Quote von Mises, it cannot be denied that fascism and similar movements aimed at the establishment of dictatorships are full of the best intentions and that their intervention has for the moment saved civilization. The merit that fascism has thereby won for itself will live on eternally in history, though it will only be temporary, he assured us. The black shirts who are rampaging will go home after having accomplished their good work. That's the foundation of neoliberalism. The same principles inspired enthusiastic neoliberal support for the hideous Pinochet dictatorship. And a few years later, they were put into operation in a different form in the global arena under the leadership of the United States and the United Kingdom. The consequences were predictable. One was sharp concentration of wealth, along with stagnation for much of the population. It's reflected in the political realm by the undermining of democracy, an immediate consequence of concentration of wealth. The impact in the United States reveals very clearly what one expects when business rule is uncontested. After 40 years, 0.1% of the population, not 1%, 0.1% have 20% of the wealth. That's twice what they had when Reagan was elected. CEO remuneration has skyrocketed, drawing general management wealth along with it. Real wages for non-supervisory male workers have declined. A majority of the population survives from paycheck to paycheck, almost no reserves. Financial institutions, largely predatory, have exploded in scale they have repeated crashes, increasing in severity. The perpetrators are bailed out by the friendly taxpayer, though that is the least of the imp implicit state subsidy that they receive. Free markets led to monopolization, reduced competition, reduced innovation, as a strong swallow the weak. Neoliberal globalization has deindustrialized the country within the framework of the investor rights agreements that are mislabeled as free trade acts, free trade pacts. Well, adopting the neoliberal doctrine that taxation is robbery, Reagan opened the door to tax havens and shell companies. They were previously banned by law, 
barred by effective enforcement. That led at once to a huge tax evasion industry to expedite massive right robbery of the general population by the very rich and the corporate sector. It's not small change. The scale is estimated in tens of trillions of dollars. And so it continues as neoliberal doctrine took hold. The assault was just beginning to take shape in the late Carter administration. And in 1978, the president of the United Auto Workers, Doug Fraser, resigned from a labor management committee that was set up by the Carter administration. He expressed his shock, I'll quote him, shock that business leaders had chosen to wage a one-sided class war in this country, a war against working people, the unemployed, the poor, the minorities, the very young, the very old, and even many in the middle class of our society. They had broken and discarded the fragile, unwritten compact previously existing during a period of growth and progress, during the period of, he didn't say this, of class collaboration under regimented capitalism. Uh, his recognition of the way the world works was somewhat belated, in fact, too late to fend off the bitter class war launched by business leaders who were soon granted free reign by compliant governments, United States, United Kingdom, later others. The consequences over much of the world come as very little surprise. Widespread anger, resentment, contempt for political institutions, and while the primary economic ones are hidden from view by effective propaganda. All of this provides fertile ground for demigods who can pretend to be your savior or stabbing you in the back, meanwhile deflecting the blame for your conditions to scapegoats, the immigrants, blacks, China, whoever fits longstanding prejudices. And that's what we're living with. Well, returning finally to the major crises we face at this historic moment, all are international and two internationals are forming to confront them. One is opening today, the progressive international. The other has been taking shape under the leadership of Trump's White House, a reactionary international comprising the world's most reactionary states. In the Western Hemisphere, the leading candidate is Bolsonaro's Brazil, a few others. In the Middle East, prime members are the family dictatorships of the Gulf, uh, Al-Sisi's Egyptian dictatorship, the harshest in Egypt's bitter history, and Israel, which long ago discarded its social democratic origins and shifted far to the right, the predicted effect of the prolonged and brutal occupation. The current agreements between Israel and the Arab dictatorships, formalizing long-standing tacit relations, are a significant step towards solidifying the Middle East base of the reactionary international. Palestinians are, of course, kicked in the face. That's the proper fate of those who lack power and do not grovel properly at the feet of the natural masters. To the east, a natural candidate is India, where Prime Minister Modi is destroying India's 
secular democracy, turning the country into a racist Hindu nationalist ethnocracy while crushing Kashmir. The European contingent includes Orban's so-called illiberal democracy in Hungary, similar elements elsewhere. The reactionary international also has powerful backing in the dominant international economic institutions. These two internationals comprise a good part of the world. One of them is at the level of states, the other ours at the level of popular movements. Each is a prominent representative of much broader social forces, which have sharply contending images of the world that should emerge from the current pandemic. One force is working relentlessly to construct a harsher version of the neoliberal global system from which they have greatly benefited with more intensive surveillance and control. The other looks forward to a world of justice and peace with energies and resources directed to serving human needs rather than the demands of a tiny minority. It's a kind of class struggle on a global scale with many complex facets and interactions. It's no exaggeration to say that the fate of the human experiment depends on the outcome of this struggle. And now it is our task to get to work. Thank you. Thank you so much, Noam, for those powerful words. We take very seriously the call to panic now. And the big question for the Progressive International is how we, how we might combine that call with a call to act immediately, especially for those of us who are living in these sort of centers of the reactionary international, as you've talked about, including me, as I call in from India today. I want to welcome the, our other three panelists to respond to Noam's wonderful speech and provide some remarks of their own. Uh, we have Nanjala Neabola, who's a writer, an independent researcher, and political analyst. Her work focuses on conflict and post-conflict transitions with a focus on refugees and migration, as well as East African politics generally. Her work has appeared in numerous publications, including Foreign Policy, Foreign Affairs, Al Jazeera, and World Politics Review, as well as chapters and edited collections. Mm -hmm. She's the author of Digital Democracy, Analog Politics, How the Internet Era is Transforming Kenya, and the co-editor of Where Women Are, Gender and the 2017 Kenyan Elections. We also have with us today Cornell West, who's a philosopher, a writer, an activist, and a public intellectual. He's a professor of the practice of public philosophy at Harvard University and holds the title of Professor Emeritus at Princeton University. He's written 20 books and is a leading social critic on issues of race, class, and political change in the US. And last, of course, we have John McDonnell, who is a member of parliament for Hayes and Harlington in the UK from 2015 to 2020. He served as the shadow chancellor of the Exchequer under party leader Jeremy Corbyn. I'd like to invite Nanjula to the floor first. Thank you. Um, it's great to be here and it's great to be part of this conversation. I really like the um, momentum that that uh, keynote gives us, which is to think about um, panic, panic now and to start to take action now. I think we are in a moment in history whereby um, a lot of forces are coming together. There's a lot of confluence of forces that I think many people seem unprepared for. And I think the reason why people are unprepared is, is really a very practical one. We haven't really grappled with history. And so we've lost our sense of orientation with the present. And we're not really prepared, I think, to um, comprehend the scale and the enormity of the challenges that lie ahead. I often talk to people who, for example, have a very warped view of the relationship that the United States, for example, has with African countries and the history of that African countries have with the United <clears throat> States, with Europe. I mean, we all know the broad strokes of colonialism, <clears throat> slavery, 
but you know the nitty gritty of what it meant for one group of people to own another group of people to ship you know hundreds and thousands of people across the ocean i think of the nitty gritty of that is often lost just last week i believe the belgian government finally conceded that it was going to return the tooth of patrice lumumba who was the former uh, prime minister of the dr of the now drc and you know i think a lot of people the first question you would think is well why was the belgian government holding on to the tooth of one of africa's brightest sons and when his life was cut short so early and when the promise of you know what he wanted to deliver for this country which is now struggling to rebuild and struggling to reorient itself you know what could have been if um um that particular arc and this is not ancient history if people had had that honesty to contend with what it, what that particular um sequence of events meant so when we think about panicking i i would invite us to also think about how can we bring history and real history the reality of both the cruelty and the generosity and the inclusion and exclusion that we've leveled against each other how do we bring history into this conversation so that as we panic we're not compounding the errors that we've made in the past so that we're moving forward with a sense of illumination um with a sense of hope um with a sense of perspective because the worst thing that could happen is what has happened over the last i would say 20 or 30 years especially with what i study with this which is a digital um era where we've seen really simple mistakes that people have made in the past being compounded because of the promise of quote and quote technology revolution and and you know a disruption and all of these vague words that have a great deal of normative impact but the people who are building the platforms have no sense of history no sense of well how did this actually play out 40 50 years ago when we started to sort people by their identities when we started to brand migrants and refugees and decide you know who was worthy and who was unworthy based on their race based on their their class based on what we perceive their value to be and where we reduce that value to money so that is really what i would love i would love to put on the table as we panic and as we start to put things in motion <clears throat> let's keep a sense of history let's keep a sense of perspective let's not make them same mistakes over and over again and um to really just as well to bring into focus that those of us who are trying to build a different future and a better future cannot be replicating the mistakes um of the people that we're up against you know we've heard a great deal i, I love um that norm has really brought in the limitations of the democratic party and how it's positioning itself because you cannot um you can't be opposed you can't just know what you're opposed to you also have to know what you stand for you also have to have a program of action that is inspired by hope and is inspired by wanting to build a better future and i would love to invite the people who are tuning into this call to also you know we know what we are against or we we have the broad strokes of what we are against but let's also start to think critically about what we stand for and that to me is what being progressive and thinking about progressive international is you know we want to think beyond geographical difference we want to think beyond class difference we want to think beyond gender difference and we want to think together collectively about what kind of world we want to live in what kind of future we want to to exist in and that is going to require not just pushing back against things but also starting to proactively work towards things what is this thing that we want uh, what is this future and what do we want it to look like thank you Thank you, Ninja, so much. Um, I now invite Dr. Cornell West onto the floor, please. Yes, first I want to say it's a blessing and an honor to be here. Thank you, Sister Varsha, for wonderful, kind, generous words. I salute Brother David and uh, Brother Giannis for having the courage and vision of bringing us together. And I appreciate the words of my dear sister, Nanjala, as well. I look forward to Brother John. I salute. my dear brother and comrade noam chomsky for his 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 words and his witness uh, he has been the intellectual freedom fighter of our time he's 91 years young and still on fire for truth and justice but he's also been an exemplar of international solidarity every corner of the globe oppressed people exploited people know that they have a comrade in him no matter what color they are they could be kurds they could be palestinian they could be jews in france they could be black people in alabama they could be peasants in brazil brother chomsky's there and i think this is very important in terms of how one sustains 
a quality of longevity of progressive internationalism even as you accent radical democracy at home. And I think that's the fundamental question of this conference. What are, what are the conditions under which and the ways in which progressive internationalism abroad and radical democracy at home can survive and thrive? And very quickly, it's a threefold crisis. It's a crisis of imagination. How do you sustain an alternative to the present neoliberal and escalating neo-fascist realities. Just being able to keep the voices alive and visible, the visions alive and visible. That's a crisis of imagination that is an intellectual struggle. It is an ideological struggle. It's a matter of trying to ensure that we make available and have available to ourselves and everyday people different lens through which they look at the world as opposed to corporate media, neoliberal, or the frenzy, which used to be on the lunatic fringe, but is now moving to the center, the neo-fascist possibilities, that reactionary internationalism that Brother Noam has rightly, rightly noted. I'm reminded of the great Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, where he used to say in 1965, the major ecumenical movement in the world is nihilism. It's the triumph of Thrasymachus over Socrates. Might makes right. Greed is good. Indifference is encouraged and rewarded. And he said indifference to evil is more insidious than evil itself. And William James said indifference is the one trait that makes the very angels weep. And we're seeing escalating indifference, not just among our elites, but those elites tied to big money, tied to big militarism, tied to big imperialism, tied to corporate rule and Wall Street rule, mobilizing a desperate people, working people, peoples of color into right wing sensibilities because they're grabbing for straws given the depth and the scope of their suffering and their social misery. So the crisis of imagination is very important. And Brother Noam accent at that, this is crucial. How do we keep track of the nuclear cat catastrophe that could take place any moment. The escalating ecological catastrophe, the economic catastrophe that Brother Bernie Sanders was talking about in the States and Brother Corbin was talking about in Britain. The class war in which working people have been pushed against the back, pushed against the wall. But then there's also the civic catastrophe, the inability of persons to even imagine what a vital and vibrant public life looks like, the kind of thing that worried the great John Dewey. Second, though, in addition to the crisis of imagination, is the crisis of cultivation. And here's the matter of the, the defense of basic virtues. We're living in an age of expansive mendacity and criminality of lies and crimes. And to defend basic virtues like integrity, intellectual integrity, telling the truth, having an analysis that's truthful, decency, honesty, and courage, and we could talk about the crisis of complicity, complacency, and cowardliness among the intellectual class in so many of our countries, the political class in so many of our countries, the elites across the board in so many of our countries who are supposed to somehow provide quote unquote leadership. Part of the neo-fascist movements in the, in the world have to do with people's contempt for neoliberal elites who lied to them, that told them they stand for justice and invoke Martin Luther King Jr. and ended up hanging out with Wall Street folk, with war profiteers who could expand AFRICOM and the, and the continent of Africa and talk about freedom for Africans, who could talk about we're concerned about Jews in the Middle East and end up making is the security of Jews even less secure owing to a vicious occupation. Or I could talk about, I can make money for the Arab elites and they themselves become part and parcel of the reactionary internationalism and therefore it cuts across color, cuts across religion, cuts across gender, cuts across sexual orientation. And yet we know we're gonna fight against transphobia. We're gonna fight against homophobia. We're gonna fight against white supremacy. We're gonna fight against male supremacy. We're gonna fight against any ideology that loses sight 
of the humanity of folks. We're going to defend our Mexican brothers and sisters, our Arab brothers and sisters, our Jewish, our Palestinian, in the name of a cultivation of virtues, integrity, honesty, decency, courage. So we got a crisis of imagination. We got a crisis of cultivation. And then we come here now, the crisis of execution. Our dear sister Tasman in the last session talked about Gramsci, concerned about this, 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 this interim moment, the old order passing away, the new order not yet to be born, almost echoes as well as Matthew Arnold. How does the new order emerge? That's, that's a tough one. Without, it, without, without the imagination providing alternative views of what the world can be, without providing highly cultivated persons who are willing to speak the truth no matter what the cost, who are willing to bear a burden, who are willing to take a risk, who are willing to make leaps of faith, not leaps of faith in terms of leaps of magic, but leaps of faith because we still believe in the capacity of ordinary people to govern themselves to shape their own destiny. It's the radical democratic face. It's a Pascalian leap of faith in ordinary people. Now we could be wrong. It could be that the species itself lacks the capacity to sustain radical democratic possibilities. Jonathan Swift might be right. The late Mark Twain might be right. So what we fight anyway because it's right, because it's just, and because we're concerned about our fellow species, no matter what the circumstances are, and we're gonna surprise some folk because we have been surprised before by revolutionary breakthroughs in the 18th century, the 19th century, the 20th century. So we've got some evidence. It's not like we have none at all, but we're fighting radically against the grain. But here we are saying, we wanna respond to the crisis of execution by creating institutions, infrastructures that are countervailing voices, forces, countervailing movements on the ground, countervailing institutions, countervailing structures, so that the best of the human species can be preserved and expanded. And what is the best? Sister Naomi talked about it. It's love, it's joy. It's play, it's communities in which human beings are treated at the deepest level as not just human beings, but sentient creatures. So we can include our dogs and our cats. We can include natural entities and objects as vows in the language of Martin Buber, not it, not objects to be manipulated, but fellow creatures to be reveled in relative to their potential and possibility. That is why this gathering is of monumental importance because we're at this unprecedented moment in the history of the species. And then it filters through the specificity of our national context, our regional context, our hemispheric context. And if we don't exemplify the kind of international solidarity that we've seen for over 75 years with our dear brother Noam Chomsky and many others, then it's clear it's over. The experience of the species is over. It's progressive internationalism or non-existence or extinction. That's what's at stake, but we do it with a smile. That's why we are blues people. And I come from a blues people. Catastrophe coming at me. Nobody loves me but my mama. And she might be jiving too. That's the king of the blues. That's B.B. King. But how does he do it? With a smile and with a style, with a connection, a connection to the best of his past, playing Lucille with the voices of Robert Johnson and Bessie Smith and Ma Rainey coming all through his voice, his guitar, with his band. Yes, we have lessons to learn from those folk who have been hated and scorned, not because of the color of their skin, but because of their imagination, their cultivation, their execution. And then we move into the middle part of this 21st century, we hope, with a better future for each and every one of us. 
Thank you so much, Dr. West. I'm hearing from both Nanjala and you the critical sort of importance um, of keeping open and nourishing the possibility of this alternate world. And it's interesting to hear that because historically, the the job of sort of building utopias and creating utopias has always been seen as being part of the work of resistance. But you're right to point out that perhaps as you know, our crises and catastrophes get more urgent and more overwhelming, we're at risk of losing that. And it's in fact the right that's, you know, in the business of creating this utopia is whether that's, um, you know, in Trump in the US with an imagination of make America great again, or Modi here in India with a call for a pure Hindu nation, which of course is an imagined one. So I'm, I'm curious to hear from our next speaker, John, who has, you know, been part of a party that's experimented with this idea of putting positive visions on the table, but within within electoral politics. Um, yes, I would love to hear you know your thoughts on the matter as well as kind of the broader question of internationalism, John. Thomas has urged us to panic, and um, Nanjala has urged us to not be constrained by history. And Cornell, in his usual wonderful style has urged us to surprise people, but with a smile. And that's what we're going to do, Cornell. We're going to do it. I'm with you, my brother. <laughs> um, look, <laughs> look, uh, we are panicking now, but it's a controlled panic. You know, this last 10 months, it's been startling. Uh, in the UK, we had the loss of the election, which was pretty devastating for many of us. And then the pandemic, and now potentially staring on the edge of... Uh, a recession we haven't seen since the 1930s, possibly. Um, and if that isn't bad enough, I tell you, the nightmare fear of Trump being elected hangs over all of us globally. In addition to that, I, of course, the, the, the existential threat of climate change is just there and at the back of our minds continuously. But ironically, you know, in the spring, the pandemic hit us so hard, it brought out the selfless best in people as well caring for one another, recognizing that we need one another. And I, that led to an element of optimism amongst progressives that lessons were, could be learned and that radical change could come about. And I heard earlier in the earlier debate, you know, the pandemic uh, acted like a sort of a pressure test on how society is organized. And it exposed all the weaknesses and failings of the neoliberal system that's been imposed upon us at least for the last 40 years. Um, all those weaknesses came out that it was undeniable that uh, the long period, a decade at least in the UK and elsewhere of austerity had left our public services, our health services, our caring services so ill prepared to deal with this pandemic and put, actually put our doctors and health workers and carers at risk. And so many of them have actually died as a result. It also exposed the, the, the grotesque level of inequality within our societies that um, well, actually meant that the, I suppose there were so many people who were left vulnerable and powerless as a result. And also, I have to say, in, across our countries, it, it did demonstrate that establishment politicians were not just lethally incompetent, but they felt they were able to act with impunity as though the rules never applied to them. But, you know, a window has opened up to change and it did open up for change and there's been a serious debate and we're part of it. And it just, ideas have flooded in across the globe about the sort of change that, that we want. And as a starting point, a common rejection amongst people of austerity, a neoliberal austerity policy being imposed upon them. And it's led to a support, I think, and common understanding that we, that we, we need real investment in our public services, in a green economy. And plus also alongside that, proper pay and conditions for the workers who provide us, especially those who provide us with the care and support we need. And I think there's an increasing, I think there's been increasingly more widely shared understanding of the need to organize our society so that in a decent society, there, there are such things as basic essentials, which everyone should have a right to, um, you know, and they shouldn't be treated as commodities, a decent roof over your head food set on the plate for you and your family, um, warmth, supply of water, all of those things. That debate, I think now, 
has opened up even further as a result of the pandemic. So I'm, in that sense, that generated in me and in many of us um, an optimism that change could come and it's got to come rapidly. Um, but, you know, here is an early note of caution for the autumn, for the fall, really. Unless progressives like us are vigilant and active, that window that we saw opening up for progressive change may soon be closing. And I just say this, the, the triumph of the politics of Trump and Johnson in this country will slam that work window firmly shut. Today, I've been attacked in the British media because I describe Boris Johnson and Trump as proto-fascist. I believe they both are. Um, they have, Trump in particular has no respect for the democratic virtues, the established democratic conventions and the institutions that are the bulwarks of our democracy, the rule of law, respect for the truth and the prime duty of protecting the safety of the people you represent. He operates with impunity, accountable to no one, it appears, and he's deliberately sowing division. And as we've seen recently, even putting lives at risk as a result. Johnson, let me be straight about this, Johnson is just a more polished version of the same act, um, buffed up for a British audience, and with the added sort of upper class, British upper class sense of entitlement. He's demonstrated also the same lack of respect for parliament, rule of law and the truth. And just like Trump, um, without a care for the damage caused, um, Johnson will deploy division. And he's scapegoating, especially migrants, whenever he needs to prop up his own career. So I, my own view is this, is that to prevent that sort of spring optimism turning into an autumn of fatalism, as Cornell has described, um, that, that fatalism that nothing will change, I think there is an inspiring hope. And I'm inspired every day when the people in the campaigners and others that I've met, those people who are seeking change. Because alongside the generation of all these ideas, there's been so many campaigns demanding change and claiming the future. Um, I, last night, I was in a meeting with renters, tenants, and they were campaigning against evictions but they're opening up the whole debate about the very existence of landlordism. And it was a Zoom meeting, and across, we had American campaigners as well, talking to those in London and the rest of the UK about the joint campaigns that they can wage to expose what's happening to them as tenants and residents and renters. We've got trade unions working internationally now, exposing the exploitation of the crisis, the exploitation of the crisis by unscrupulous employers. And they're calling the effort on ongoing support from the state, but also they're demanding an end to precarious work and working together to do that internationally. And we've seen health workers, public service workers, right the way across the globe now demanding decent pay and opposing, interestingly as well, in many countries opposing privatization of their public services. And of course we've, We've just seen, I just, well, what can you say, the magnificent mobilization of the Black Lives Matters movement that's inspired, well, I think inspired the Grove now to address the issue of racial justice and equality. And now again, environmentalists are on the move with direct action campaigns to preserve our planet. So even with all the organizational challenges that we've faced, that have been thrown up by the lockdown created by the pandemic, Campaigning has continued and has continued on a wide front on a range of issues. And I think it's been truly inspiring. But it's also a lesson to politicians because it's hard to see the new generation that's come into this field of struggle just waiting for elections to have their concerns addressed. Uh, I think members of this generation that have arrived, are, they're willing to take on exploitative rip off landlords, they're willing to take on employers who subject their workers to inhumane conditions at work and they're willing to take on the corporate that damage and threaten our environment and they're even to take willing to take on lying mendacious governments and politicians and they're armed with fresh ideas and the means of communicating those ideas and mobilizing in numbers maybe on scale we've not seen before 
So it's interesting, I say to elected politicians, uh, to be seen to have any relevance to the future, any political party or politician needs to wake up to movement politics. Uh, it's that's movement politics that could save us from Trump and Johnson, but also uh, from a return to being comfortably numb with the grotesque inequalities of our society and the prospect of climate change. So I, I think, as Noam has so eloquently pointed out, all of these threats cross borders. They do not respect national boundaries or continental boundaries, for that matter. And that's why I agree with Cornell and the others. I actually think why Progressive International is so important. It's so key to the mobilization of, a well, let's be ambitious, a global alliance for change, but also for immediate and urgent action. The planet, <laughs> the planet cannot wait any longer and they cannot wait or allow for any further delay so i'm i'm here on the basis of solidarity and i wholeheartedly throw my support behind this ambitious initiative but it is solidarity that will see us through thank you john the planet certainly cannot wait in your call for politicians to kind of take notice of movement politics and especially in the generational politics is one that I think many, many, many elected officials around the world would be um, well served to follow. But I've also been hearing from all of you this idea of kind of solidarity and that's so interlinked with the idea of internationalism. And perhaps with the pandemic, we've seen very clear examples of that at the local level, whether that's with mutual aid groups, care cooperatives, feminist collectives that have sort of come up all over. I'm curious, Noam, if I could ask you, you know, what does solidarity mean to you, especially as you talk about internationalism? The pandemic has brought out a number of different aspects of human qualities. One of them is the spontaneous development of mutual aid and mutual support, which has been quite remarkable to see. Uh, often in the poorest, most oppressed areas, uh, where groups of people, where the governments are doing nothing, uh, people are just getting together to help one another, uh, to provide food for one another if there's some uh, elderly person stuck in an apartment to, to help them. Uh, some of it is almost astonishing. Like in Brazil, in the favelas in uh, Rio, some of the most degraded circumstances in the world, I'm sure you're all familiar with them, uh, people crammed together in miserable slums, uh, no water, no, uh, no place to almost nothing available to them. Well, the government, of course, is doing nothing, nothing to help them. But they are getting organized in systems of mutual support uh, to aid as much as possible within those grim circumstances. And who has initiated the organization? The crime gangs that had been terrorizing the neighborhood. They've shifted their mission to organizing mutual aid and mutual support. We're seeing things like that happening all over the world. It's bringing out what's needed from every part of the society, from your local neighborhood to the international arena, because as everyone has rightly emphasized, all of this is international. There are no borders. We're all in it together, uh, wherever we are, uh, there's no way to stop these uh, horrors individually. Uh, Cornell brought up a quote, famous quote from Gramsci about how we're living in an age of monsters. The new world has yet to emerge. Uh, we don't know what it will be. I'd like to add another quote that uh, Gramsci made famous, uh, we should have pessimism of the intellect and optimism of the will. And there's plenty of reason for optimism of the will, as all of you have pointed out. 
Black Lives Matter movement in the United States is a striking example. Uh, from it didn't come out from nowhere. There's been a rising consciousness and concern over the years. Uh, plenty of activists involved, plenty of spokespersons, uh, Cornell, many others. Uh, when George Floyd was murdered, it just broke out within no time the largest social movement in american history developed with enormous popular support two-thirds support way more than martin luther king had at the peak of his popularity and it's international there were solidarity actions elsewhere in the world too often focusing on their own counterparts black and white together uh, working and coming up with important ideas about not only dealing with the problems of police murder of Afro-Americans, but about the institutional bases of racism, class oppression, other forms of uh, attacks on human rights and dignity that we should never tolerate. Okay, so that's the basis for optimism. The Progressive International is a focus can be a focus and a leader for bringing us out of the age of monsters into a new world of justice concern for others mutual support uh, moving on to a much more free and just world it's within our grasp thank you noam and that note of sort of hope is something that Nanjala you mentioned in you know in your speech as well and no when you initially talked you talked about attachment barriers and how liberty doesn't you know liberty depends on good faith and common decency and i guess what's so scary about demagogues or constitutional authoritarians who have you know been elected into office as all of you mentioned is even if we could successfully resist them and sort of the institutions that have been put in place under their rule and under their governments the repair of intimacies, the repair of interpersonal relationships, whether that's with deep polarization in the US or closer to home for me, communal divisions that have set, that have been set in and sort of the social fabric that's been damaged as a result of um, the Hindutva politics here, that seems a lot harder to be able to fix. In our previous panel, we talked about the years of repair. We talked about the damage done to the climate. We talked about damage done to entire countries in the global south because of austerity politics. But how do we address, Nanjala, from your uh, from your perspective, this sort of repair, but of intimacies? Well, let me bring up Gramsci again, since he seems to be the topic of conversation. Uh, one of his great contributions was to point out that we live under what he called a system of hegemonic common sense. There are things that are drilled into us constantly, schools, media, environment, that become so, become like the air we breathe. We can't question them. They're mostly highly oppressive and brutal. And as soon as you lift the veil, it all becomes obvious. So take one fundamental element of our society today the idea that it's a wonderful thing to have a job it's a wonderful thing to spend most of your waking life uh, as the servant of a tyrant who has more power over you than stalin ever dreamed of like stalin never said you can have a bathroom break it. 3 p.m. for five minutes, or here are the kinds of clothes you have to wear, or you're allowed to talk to this person for one second, but if you, and if you walk on this path rather than another path that our algorithms figured out, you get fired. Stalin never said that, but that's the way most people spend their working lives. Now for 2000 years, from classical Greece and Rome, up to the, all the way through classical liberalism, into the early industrial revolution, such ideas were considered an abomination. The idea that you should be subject to somebody else's will, 
was considered an intolerable attack on human dignity and rights. It was so obvious that it was a slogan of the Republican Party under Abraham Lincoln, one of the last classical liberals. For them, wage labor was no different from slavery, except that it was temporary, so you could free yourselves from it, become a free human being. That was the slogan of the uh, major uh, labor or huge labor organizations that developed in the late 19th century, early industrial revolution in the United States, earlier in England. Those, their slogan was, those who work in the mills should own them. What were called factory girls, young women from the farms who were forced into the textile mills, uh, had their own press, labor press, eloquent press, in which they bitterly condemned the uh, industrial, the uh, autocracy of the industrial system that was forcing them to become slaves to a master instead of independent human beings. It's taken a century of propaganda to sort of drive this out of people's minds, but I think it's right below the surface. And uh, John pointed out that we can look forward to radical change. I don't think that's very hard. In fact, I think the means to do it are very close at hand. And furthermore, the corporate elite knows it. They're running scared. Take a look at the last Davos meetings where the January, where the great and powerful, the people who call themselves the masters of the universe, gather in a fancy Swiss resort, ski resort, to talk about how wonderful they are. It was different last January. There was a different theme. The theme was we're in trouble. They're coming after us. We've got to change our face. We have to become what used to be called 60 years ago, soulful corporations. That was the line in the 50s. We're now realized that we made mistakes. This whole neoliberal period was a mistake. Now we understand it. Now, from now on, we're going to work for the benefit of the workers, the community, the people will slave endlessly for their benefit. Trust us, put your faith in us. They're saying that because of what in their own internal memos they call reputational risks, meaning they're coming after us. We're not going to get away with this anymore. Well, we can, we have a choice. We can decide okay, they're becoming soulful corporations, we'll put their trust in them, or we can dismantle them. It's not that hard. I take, say, the fossil fuel industries. We don't just have to tell them to stop destroying the world. We can take them over. In fact, it would cost almost nothing to buy them with the cost of oil today. And buy them doesn't mean put them into the hands of the dictator. It means put them into the hands of their workforce and the communities so they will do what has to be done. And they can get much more employment by doing things simply like capping the wells that are pouring methane into the air and creating and shifting to sustainable energy programs. They know they're going to have to do it. We don't have to wait for BP to decide to do it because that's what their bottom line says. We can take it over and do it right now with their own workforce taking the lead and their own communities doing it. And it's the same across the board. We don't have to suffer from the predatory financial institutions. Consider public institutions, public banks, post office to be a public bank. Okay, goodbye JP Morgan Chase, we don't need you. We don't want you to fund fossil fuel industries because you're not gonna have the money for it, okay? Uh, it's coming very close to that, and if consciousness would change, it could happen. So, for example, just go back 10 years, the financial crash after the housing crash in the United States. Now, President Obama virtually nationalized the auto industry. It was collapsing. Government had to take it over. Okay, there were two choices. One is bail it out 
return it to the former owners, maybe new faces, and have them do exactly what we don't need. Jam up the highways with more cars, police and police. That was one option. The other option is hand it over to the workforce and the communities. Let them take it over. Let them do what we all need, including them, like efficient mass transportation. That was a possibility. It was hegemonic common sense and its rule that prevented it. But that we can change. We can change that. We can work to bring forth the common understanding of working people, factory girls, artisans, not more than a hundred years ago, when they all understood that these relations are in, totally intolerable. Yes, they are. Now we can end them. Not very hard. I think it could be very close. But things like the Green New Deal, I think, are extremely important. They presuppose the existence of existing institutions, which makes sense just because of time scale. You know, we have to deal with this lethal threat of environmental catastrophe quickly. But part of what they're doing is building alternative institutions, like what I just described. And that can be a growing part of the international effort to deal with the whole range of grim threats that we face on a local scale. You can do it in your own community or even by yourself, up to the international level. I think all of those possibilities are open to us. Thank you, Noam. I see everyone on the panel smiling. There's no one quite like you who can wave their hand through centuries of history and ground what it means to take bathroom breaks in the future in perspective. Um, thank you for that statement. I see we have Nanjala back. Um, before I give you the floor, Angela, I just want to ask if, you know, to add to the question I asked earlier, maybe you could speak a little bit about whether perhaps you see a challenge in increasing technocracy with the pandemic now and calls for increased science, sort of increased trust in institutions, um, and whether that you see that as a challenge to local ground level decision making. Also putting in perspective sort of all of your work with um, technologies and technologies of violence. Nanjala, can you hear me? Okay, it seems we lost Nanjala, but I think we have just about enough time for a round of closing comments. So I want to give Dr. West and John the floor, um, maybe about two to three minutes each for any final comments about the panel. Brother John, do you want to go? I'll be very brief, but there's a wonderful essay by the eminent American philosopher Josiah Royce in his book, Race Questions, the only classical American philosopher in the past, a vanilla brother who's quite a genius in his own right, but not the greatest of the ones like Chomsky and James and Dewey. But uh, he, he has a, a, a distinction between provincialism and parochialism. And I think this is very important because there's a difference between radical democratic internationalism and more moderate cosmopolitanism. The more moderate cosmopolitanism has some wonderful features and Anthony Appiah is my dear brother, he's written well about this, but that cosmopolitanism really doesn't constitute a threat to the powers that be. It doesn't, it doesn't examine critically and socratically the structures and institutions in place so it can end up being a multicultural, multinational parlor game in which you, you, you talk about cutting across national boundaries and so forth, but there's no critique of predatory capitalism. There's no critique of its imperial tentacles. There's no real targeting of the white supremacy in its structural forms. So what we're talking about here in progressive internationalism is a radical democratic internationalism that does believe in provincialism, which is to say, all of us have roots. All of us come from certain places. You can't separate Brother Noam Chomsky from the north side of Philadelphia. 
in University of Pennsylvania, Nelson Goodman, and MIT, and now Arizona, we all come from somewhere. The question is whether our R-O-O-T-S will be able to expand into our R-O-U-T-E-S, what the great Paul Gilroy talks about. And those routes take us into a radical democratic international solidarity with oppressed peoples, very different than the moderate cosmopolitanism that remains very much an elite affair and all too often a way of downplaying the kind of critiques of structures and institutions that we need this day and this time. Thank you, Cornell. John? Oh, I see we have Nanjala back. Could you hear us, Nanjala? I want to give you the floor before we lose you again. <laughs> Hi. Whoops, I was too late. All right, back back to you, John. We'll get Nanjala back. Oh, okay, let's let's hope and get Nanjala back. Um, look, I can I can sit and listen to Cornell all night. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and it's a privilege to be on the on on this panel. Um, look. I think what, what, one of the roles we've got to play is to be extremely pragmatic and concrete about the discussions that we now have. And I think it's about learning some of the lessons of what's happening on the ground at the moment and then trying to translate the lessons into international action. And the, the point I make is no one has touched upon this in all our communities. I represent where I live, a local working class community on the edge of London. And people have just mutual aid, people have supported each other tremendously. Food banks, visiting one another, um, keeping an eye just on the elderly, the isolated elderly, taking people if necessary to hospital, picking up the medicines that they need. There's been a flowering of mutual aid, which flies in the face of everything that we've been told for years about how people are greedy and selfish, and they're not. They're not given the opportunity. And that has resulted, interestingly enough, in, in the UK. And let me just give you an example. The trade union membership is increasing in this country at the moment dramatically because people are coming together to in solidarity, working with one another, but also to speak up for one another as well. And it's quite remarkable. So people are beginning to find really creative ways of challenging the system. Give you another example. I have a meeting with financial advisors and economists and others. And one person, a young man, um, again, a, a trained economist came in and said, actually, let's stop talking about the city of London in those terms and the operation of the financial system. Let's start from the roots. City of London is based on the profits from slavery. Why don't we accept that in every, and why don't we make reference to that in everything we say? So let's now start talking about reparations. That conversation wouldn't have happened if it hadn't been for Black Lives Matter. It wouldn't have happened. So creativity is coming to place. And it does remind me some of the historical precedents as well. I met a few older gentlemen um, up in Scotland, and they were the trade unionists who, when uh, British companies were sending engines, airplane engines, to the Pinochet regime, they went on strike and refused to work on them, refused to transport them, etc. And it was such an inspiration to some of the youngsters that were sitting there. They then started thinking, what can we do in that sort of international solidarity? And I think it's ever vesting at the moment. And what we've got to do, I think, is exactly, yes, it is, it is Gramsci's, you know, pessimism, the intellect, optimism, the will, of course it is. But also, you know, we, we campaign for years now on another world is possible. I think we've got to start saying to people, as Noam said, another world is in sight. It's nearly there and we could take it and make it. And I, I think that's the optimism we've got to portray and demonstrate. But as, Co as Cornell said, with a smile on our face as well, and maybe a bit of blues as well. <laughs> um, Why not? <laughs> I think we, we've got our Nanjala, sister back. We've got our we sister back. You back. Yeah. We're back. I, I, I feel like that's um, probably a cautionary tale about inclusivity and access, but 
more likely that I just need to have a word in my ISB. Um, <laughs> I wanted to really uh, come back on this issue of um, fight for the things that make us human. Fight for the things that make us human. And I love what um, Cornell said about, um, you know, joy and love and, and kindness and all of these values that the neoliberal structures that we live under want us to eliminate. Um, we've talked about the nature of work and the structure of work. Think about also the nature of school and the nature of study. You know, this whole STEM, 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 STEM paradigm is based on taking the best and the brightest and the smartest and the most passionate people and taking away, you know, their, their humanity and their, their perspective and their context and turning them into functionaries who are unable to distinguish between, who are unable to presage rather or to see the impact that some of the choices that they make will have on the people around them. And especially when you think about, I, like I said, I work a lot around tech and I work a lot with people who are not really, you know, it's, it's almost like the worst kind of um, um, situation because they don't think they're doing the wrong thing. They don't think that they're they're going to hurt anybody. They've been told that their role is in this, is to optimize, you know, whatever platform they're building. Their role is to optimize whatever technology they're building. They're not being told that their role is to make sure that everybody, humanity, from the wealthiest to the poorest, from the most powerful to the weakest, is okay, isn't harmed. And, and we're, we're almost sleepwalking into catastrophes because all of these amazing, mostly young people who are, are, are you know, just trying to find their place in the world, the language of change, the language of, of um, progress has been co-opted into the structure that tells them, don't think about what makes you human. Don't think about what makes you part of a society. Don't think what, about what makes you part of a community. So the only countervailing force or the primary countervailing force that I think we can bring to the table is to fight for the things that make us human. You know, we've talked about mutual aid and, and showing up for each other in these um, crises and showing up for each other in these pandemics, choosing the things that are uncomfortable, the things that maybe don't necessarily make sense in the frameworks um, that we are, you know, compelled to live under, but ultimately our decision to be human in a world where being human is often penalized and sometimes even criminalized. Um, you look at how many of our cities are treating homeless people, you know, putting spikes on benches that homeless people can't sleep. Um, you know, the way in which um, in here in Kenya, you know, the police will, will beat and, and tear gas homeless people to, you know, round people up. And, and I think you know, to just keep that humanity in perspective and to go back to the basics of what it is that make us human. And the other piece of the puzzle that I think is really important on a practical level is we should not underestimate the value of consciousness raising. I think one of the things that I found in my own advocacy and work is that you can't assume that everybody has the same amount of information that you have, especially in a world where education systems, especially where education systems have been deliberately undermined and deliberately compromised so that people have no sense of history. You read reports about how few British students know um, what the British Empire did and what it meant to be part of an empire and what it meant to be in the periphery of an empire. And they think that the empire is, you know, benign, you know, uh, singing uh, grand orchestra pieces every night of the proms and not really realizing what that empire was one of the most cruel political constructions that has ever been put together. Um, you know, high school students in the United States who would say that they're in favor of bombing, um, you know, Iran, but can't find Iran on a map. Um, you know, you have here, we, in, in Africa, we have a, a, a rise in xenophobia in South Africa. And we have, you know, you ask South Africans, well, do you know where Somalia is? And there'll be a, no, very few will be able to actually find Somalia on the map. So what is it that our education is doing is distorting our consciousness, is distorting our sense of place, is distorting our sense of action, and therefore our sense of possibility. So we can't we cannot underestimate the value of consciousness raising, of using whatever tools we have um, before us. And, you know, for some of us, it's, you know, social media, it's uh, being in the press, it's being in the public eye, but also just talking, you know, just good old fashioned building communities of, of interpretation, building communities of conversation where people can actually start giving give themselves time to think. Um, our current structure has very little value on thought. You see how our humanities departments and universities are being decimated. You see how kids are being set up to be able to go through 
you know, many years of high school, many years of, of primary school without ever reading anything that's not a business text or a science text. We're being told that the only good education is the one that gets you that MBA, is the one that gets you that engineering job, is the one that gets you that purely, you know, a structural job, is the one that doesn't push you to think, is the one that doesn't push you to interrogate, is the one that doesn't push you to start to question the system. And we have to push back against that. We have to fight for thought and we have to fight for independent thought and critical thought so that we don't end up in the situation or compounding the situation that we have now where people are getting that intellectual stimulation from you know charlatans basically and snake oil salesmen when in fact we've been through cycles people have written people have taught people have researched you know we talked about the black lives matter movement um and 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 no pointed rightly pointed out this building out of 60, 70, even 100 years of prison, prison abolitionist um, discourse. People have thought about these things. We have to fight for that consciousness and to protect it and preserve it and pass it on within our communities. Thank, thank you for that. It suddenly seems like the theme of the evening is to take on this crisis of imagination with you know, critical thought and consciousness raising. Um, thank you again for this wonderful, wonderful discussion. I'm so honored to have shared the stage with you all, but also incredibly excited as a member of the Secretariat to continue to think through how the Progressive International can begin to embody the direction and I should say attitudes and emotions as well that we've talked about today as we continue to engage in this work. It gives me great joy to know that all of our comrades who are part of our growing coalition have you to rely on as council members. Thanks so much also to our audience. We invite you to join us. We're only as strong as our members and your support is what makes everything we do possible. Please consider donating and help us continue to mobilize progressive forces in a common planetary front. Do stay with us. Next up, we have a very exciting panel with leaders from across South America. Jo join Luis Arce, a Bolivian presidential candidate from the movement towards socialism, along with Alicia Castro, Andres Raos, and Bifilas across the world to discuss how progressive forces are fighting to reclaim democracy and popular sovereignty in Bolivia and across Latin America against increasing powerful tactics of legal warfare or lawfare. Stay tuned and we'll be right back in about 20 minutes. Thank you. <laughs>